I, I'm sure everybody knows Dave Douglas, and you should welcome him. Yeah. Thank you. Um, somebody I'll bet we've all been listening to uh, for quite a while in a lot of different contexts, all very challenging, all very rewarding. Um, someone I've had the pleasure of listening to, gee, I think I heard you play with Horace Silver in that brief moment uh, in the late 80s, but then uh, from his first album on, and um, it's, uh, there's been no lapse. It's really been an incredible, consistent um, output of great music. And Dave asked that we um, confine our time this afternoon. So we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and I'm going to open it up for 10 minutes of questions. Uh, in a way, I feel less like I'm cheating all of you with the time, because there's a great cover story in Downbeat, which has been available up at the theater on the weekend concerts. They're giving them away if you haven't gotten a copy. It's so good, I almost felt like I should just beat it to everyone. And say, <laughs> Dave, chill out for a while, you know. Um, I'll, I'll sit in the back and listen to a uh, uh, good reminder. But s several things resonated with me in no particular order. Um, this is your 50th birthday year, mm -hmm. and you've come up with a very ambitious way to celebrate it, and I wondered if you could talk about it and talk about the most uh, unexpected or satisfying performance in the line so far that you've been able to have. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, first of all, for having me, and it's great to be here in Burlington. This is, as you know, a state as well. Right. So this is my Vermont, uh, and hopefully not the only Vermont visit, but um, it's lovely to be up here, and we're in the conclusion of a New England tour where we've played all the states. So um, it's, it's, I would have to say, you know, I'm, I, it's a wonderful feeling to be out playing in the country in places where we don't normally go. Now, and that, if I can the, explain, the, the, for the 50th birthday, you basically challenged yourself to play in each of the 50 states, correct? Right. right. Traditionally, when you live in New York, you figure the whole world revolves around New York. So you have a big birthday and you just play a New York concert and, right. or concerts or whatever. And I decided I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something more unusual. And so the idea is to visit all 50 states. Um, a lot of places I've never been to and look forward to getting to. And um, and it's also, um, I think, an, a, a reminder to me how challenging the network is for jazz and creative music in the United States. That it's really um, not as put together as it should be. And uh, that there are great audiences who love the music all over the place, but there's this disconnection. And so I, what we've been finding is that you know, you find the enthusiastic people in a place like Wyoming, and then you go there and you realize there is a wonderful audience, but they, you know, it, it's almost like it raises the profile for everybody, mm -hmm. for us, for them, for the audience. And I, so it feels like a really, really um, worthy endeavor that goes beyond my own music and hopefully to enabling other musicians to, to make these same trips. Um, and then I'll add one more wrinkle, since I always seem to like to make things difficult for myself, is that um, I also, I'm, I really love not just, you know, being places, but also, you know, seeing the land and getting outside and, and really, you know, celebrating the majesty of these natural treasures that we have in the country. So I'm, I'm trying to find a way to get some of these concerts to take place in spectacular outdoor locations. And um, with that in mind, I want to encourage everyone to visit Dave, what, Dave's website for updates about some of the other concerts, because there are some very interesting things still in the planning stage. At our well, we're hoping lines. to um, find I, I think that you know when, when you get outside in national forests and stuff, it's what's really important is to have the thing also draw attention to environmental sensitivity. You know, bringing people to the woods, bringing music to the woods, bringing the woods to the music, all kinds of meetings like that, but also to do it in a way that is really holistic. So um, 
what we, we are going to do a New Hampshire free concert on August 24th, but you'll have to hike to get there. <laughs> and it's gonna be at least moderately challenging, perhaps slightly more than moderately challenging. And that's what, you know, thanks Bob, because we will be through the website updating with the details of where it is and how you'll get there. And we hope to see all of you um, with a good Coming pair out. of shoes on and everything. And good weather. <laughs> but, you know, I also, we played in Portland, Maine the other night, and I went to summer camp in Maine every year from when I was six till I was 14 at mm -hmm. Madamic summer camp. And, uh, you know, learned to build a fire and outdoor stuff. And, mm -hmm. and just to be back in Portland and see some of those people and uh, visit the shore and have a lobster roll you know, it just made the concert so much more special for us. Well, you know, when I asked the question about what's been the most surprising or striking, I was really thinking of just the country and the landscape as well as the audiences. Um, I'm always fascinated when people can take the big picture of the United States and then tell me what really stands out for them. For instance, mm -hmm. a friend of mine who is British and had a job placing foreign students in American universities found at the end of his job he had been to the 48th of the 50 states wow. and decided I've got to go to the other two and then I've got to decide what is my favorite place in the U.S. Hmm. And, and he, when he was done, he told me Tucson, Arizona and the land outside of Tucson was what really struck him the most. And I just wondered if, if you've oh. had any of those moments so far. It's, it, yes, but I, too numerous to mention. I feel like everywhere I go, something special happens. Oh, yeah. But a couple of highlights are that... Um, we, I, we played in Oklahoma, and I was also working with some of the musicians there, and during the concert, um, this great trumpet player who had been on the faculty at the university for many years, and you know, from there, he leans over to me and he says, you know, son, I like your music. It's good for fishing. <laughs> It's like, you know, if I hadn't embarked on this project, I would have never heard that comment, and I wouldn't know that my music is good for fishing. Um, I also learned to play craps in Reno, Nevada on this tour, and, you know, that took some and doing. And to keep touring. I, I only lost $26, okay. so, you know, that's like, if I'd lost $50, there would have been some poetic value to that, but okay. 26 was okay. Um, the, one of the things that struck me in the interview... Uh, you talked about the struggles you had just playing the trumpet and really getting your chops together, we would say, and going through different teachers and everything. Yeah, and you make me feel like I should be going back to practice No, no, right but now, I mean yeah. to have, have listened to you <laughs> and really um, been knocked out by, among other things, your ability as an instrumentalist. I found it hard to believe that once upon a time Dave Douglas was told, son, you'll never be a trumpet player, pick another instrument. I don't know if you ever felt like, um, well, I, I think maybe that's good advice. I mean, did you ever reach that point? It doesn't sound like you did. Um, I, you know, I considered it. I, I, love, I love playing piano. I thought about it, but I don't know why. I just never quit. I felt like something about the trumpet was like having a voice to, to write for. And I, I think I was almost more of a conceiver than an instrumentalist, and so I put up the, the fight to try to figure out how to play. You know, I'm still struggling. It's a really hard instrument. Anybody brass players in here? Yeah, it's, you know, every day is a new day with the instrument. It's looking at you with one eye open. So, oh yeah? <laughs> Again, huh? Okay, you're still trying. It's, it's just, a, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but um, I found a wonderful teacher uh, first of all, I, I, I was introduced to John McNeil, who's a great um, jazz trumpeter, and he was the one who told me to go see Carmine Caruso, and this was in 85 or so. 80, no, no, earlier, 83 or 84. Carmine Caruso was a legendary brass guru who, um, at the time I studied with him, was about 85, 86 years old. And uh, everybody studied with Freddie Hubbard, um, you, you know, you name it, Woody Shaw, and classical musicians. And then he got to be so legendary that musicians on any instrument would go 
and you'd go in and he'd be teaching a violinist or a saxophonist or a French horn player. Because he had a method, I mean, to, to, to the most way, basic way to describe it is that he, he had an idea about how to teach your body to do, to perform actions in time. And that the act of producing a sound on an instrument is a matter of coordination of infinite variables, but you try to break down all those variables into a, a very, very controlled performance in time. So your body finds the easiest way to make the sound. And that, that was, the you know, after having played the trumpet already for oh, 10 years by that time and still struggling with it, it was finally, I, because of that technique, okay. things started to come together. Did you have uh, an aha moment where you said, oh, I've, I've made you know, a breakthrough here? <laughs> I, I, I didn't, and it, because his method is just, it's something you just, it's a practice that you do every day. Like if you did meditation every day, and well, I guess theoretically you're supposed to have an aha moment, and that would be enlightenment, wouldn't it? <laughs> but I think it takes a lot longer than that. So usually, you know, you're like scratching at flies and being distracted and whatever, and so that's the practice. You just do it every day, and so Carmine's practice was really you're just doing these exercises. And you come in to his studio and do the exercises for him, and the only time he gets upset, you know, if it sounds horrible and the notes don't come out, that's not a problem. The only time he would get upset would be if you did the exercise wrong. Then he, would, he was very stern, very angry. But um, I do, you know, at the same time that I was doing that, I was also playing on the street in New York with bands. Um, we had like a gas power generator, so there'd be electric bass and electric guitar and drums, and we'd be playing in Times Square against the traffic and mm -hmm. Astor Place and City Hall. And so it was this incredible strength building thing for a trumpet player to have to try to bounce your sound off the building across the street after having a lesson with Carmine Caruso. <laughs> um, and uh, I. I guess, you know, you're asking me about an aha moment. I remember one moment when um, a buddy of mine from college who always made fun of me because I played so bad um, saw me playing in the street in New York, and I saw this look of terror in his face. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, maybe, maybe it's coming together. Okay. <laughs> um, you also talk about the years before you started recording, before you started leading your own bands, when you were just taking whatever jobs were available. And I wonder if, if that situation posed the same kind of, oh, is this worth keeping? I mean, was there a gig that was just so bad? Did uh -huh. you ever said, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah, me oh, <laughs> almost, yeah, all the time. Okay. No, but why am I doing, no. I never questioned that I would stay in the music, but I did some really horrible, yeah, weddings, Bar mitzvahs, divorces, <laughs> brisses. Oh, those the divorce <laughs> <are gonna> be... <laughs> And you know what you get paid for a bris? A oh, no. <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> Better you than me. Yeah. Um, shows how so, old I really am. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did a lot of really horrible gigs, and I have a lot of funny stories about them, which I could share, but I don't know if that's why we're here. But, but none so horrible that you were ready to throw in the towel. Um, no. I guess what happened was when I, right when I got out of college, in order to survive, I took a couple, you know, quote unquote, straight jobs. And I, that was what I hated so much. That was what made me want to give up everything. So then I made a decision. I'm only going to, as long as I'm playing music, as long as I'm, working and playing the horn, I'm just going to do that. So th I think that's what got me through some really horrible gigs. I had a gig where I had to dress in a Sir Walter Raleigh outfit and, <laughs> and play a five-foot-long trumpet for arriving tourists at a Times Square hotel. And it was me and a friend both dressed up like this. And so the, the gig was like three minutes on, 20 minutes off. Right, because the, the bus arrives and they all get off and we're standing there playing and then they go in and then we wait for the next bus. Okay. So we're, most of the gig we're just sitting around in Times Square Indian wearing these beefeater costumes. And so 
we, <laughs> to make it fun, we started coming up with little gimmicks. So we, we would play like Baroque style, fake, you know, Shakespeare, Harold trumpet. But we would go, okay, this time we'll do the Harold trumpet thing, but we'll play over giant steps. <laughs> and so we would, it was actually, we would do it, and it was kind of fun and, and kooky, but, you know, then we got fired. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was probably a blessing, anyway. <laughs> you also talked about, um, right at the very beginning of your interest in jazz, the Smithsonian collection and listening to that. Yeah. And your experience, it really resonated with me, the notion of when you're exposed to all of what is called jazz early on, and it's all new, you, you don't start making judgments and categorizations and hierarchies, and you just kind of take it all in. And my equivalent when I was a kid and went to the library having heard a Ray Charles record with instrumentals on it and say, wow, let's see what else I can find like this, hmm. was the Playboy Jazz All-Stars. But it was the same idea. You got Louis Armstrong and you got Sonny Rollins and you got Miles Davis and you got Jack Teagarden and hmm. on and on. And it's all new and all different. So um, hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little about that kind of openness because I think today that a lot of people, they find what they like, they kind of stay there, they don't move one way, they don't move the other mm. way. Uh, but, but this really struck me about your early listening experiences. Hmm. Um, what was... What well, I, I, about, about being open, you know, having been exposed to everything rather than just the narrow slice initially. Yeah, well, I mean... I think we're all exposed to all kinds of stuff. It's just whether you pay attention or not. And I think that, you know, hearing Stevie Wonder in my sister's record collection pulled my ear. And, you know, hearing the Eagles in my brother's record collection pulled my ear. And then my dad listened to early Baroque music, early jazz, and modern jazz. And then, you know, the, the great classical composers also were represented. And, and then I sort of found the Beatles on my own and no one ever told me which one was important and which one was, was not. Um, I think, you know, it's important for kids to have lots of music around and lots of culture and arts, dance, and go to the theater and go to museums. And I know if you're a parent, sometimes that can be a real pain, dragging your kid to the museum on a beautiful Sunday. Sunday. But uh, I just feel like you never know where that's going to lead. Even if you feel like it's not going in a child, it, it is. And, and that's what I took away. I think that, you know, a lot of people, when, when I say this, this, people ask, well, then, you know, how did you end up being a jazz player? Because there was no one in my house really playing jazz, and there was no, um, no one even in my community when I was that age no one around me playing jazz. And, and I think that um, first of all, I, you know, I had piano lessons from a really small age. And I found it really objectionable that I couldn't play the piece a different way each time. Like I just didn't understand the idea that you would only play it that way, the way it is on the page every time. That I just found that so I was like, well, I, I did that on Tuesday. Why do I do that on Thursday? It doesn't make any sense. I'm playing it again now. Why wouldn't I play it the way it should be played today? And that, I don't, you know, I, maybe, maybe most kids, maybe that's not so unusual. But when I heard Cecil Taylor and Eric Dolphy and Thelonious Monk and um, John Coltrane and... Um, um, Sonny Rollins, you know, I think that resonated with me. I felt like, okay, here's something that's moving, that's progressive, that's a little bit different every time. Even like, um, you know, that piece, Ornette Coleman, Free Jazz, great, great recording, um, and there was a segment of it in that collection. And I found like... Oh, they had Ornette Solo? Is Ornette that? Solo, yeah. and then the ensemble parts on right. either side. And I felt like, okay, I can listen to this over and over and I hear it differently every time. Because there's so much freedom and improvisation going on. I'm hearing new parts every time I listen to it. And um, 
you know, I think maybe you were talking about, you know, people that list, that stay with the same kind of music. Right. Maybe that's why they do, because they keep hearing new things, you know. I, every time I hear Justin Bieber, I hear different. <laughs> <laughs> you so I just like to go other places oh, as well. well that's, that, that's another place. Um, you mentioned free jazz. It, it, I believe in the last few weeks there have been a lot of news coverage about a Pollock painting that was cleaned and, that's right. and possibly yeah. partially destroyed. And I believe that was the cover painting of the free jazz LP. Yeah. It's the same painting. Just right, but seen. right, and it was you also altered. You might altered. have seen it at the museum on Sunday. On it was also day. altered. There were, there were brush strokes that were clearly not Pollock's oh, okay. that were added by someone else later on who thought they were fixing it, okay. apparently. Right. Um, I love that. It's so great. If only we could go back and do that with our classic jazz albums. <laughs> you know. Or our articles or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, one of, one of the things that was initially so striking about you was... Your, your diverse interests and your ability to kind of articulate them all at a very high level, which I think was unusual. I mean, you must have had half a dozen or more bands going at one point, and you talked in the Downbeat article about how on your 40th birthday, you kind of took stock on that and, and changed the balance. And, and I wonder if you could talk about that and about what the right balance is for you now in terms of all the different music you could hmm. be making. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I, it's always, the re, the, one of the reasons that we're keeping this to a shorter length is because I, you know, talking about the music and making the music are really, really two different activities for me. So it's really hard to talk about it sometimes. And I find if I'm talking about the music right before a concert, I, I'm not able to go to the place that I want to go to in, when I'm playing. Okay. It's a very nonverbal activity. And so um, I just feel like uh, it's hard to, you know, I, I did, I had about 10, maybe 12 bands going there. Um, and that started when I was 30. And, you know, there was that long period where I couldn't get a record deal. And then when I finally did get a record deal, suddenly every independent label wanted to record me. Mm -hmm. And I had all of these projects in place that already existed. So that was how I emerged, and it seemed like I was in 15 places at one time, but it was really a process of years putting all those projects together. And, uh, and I kept them all going. I, I don't like to do projects that are one-offs. I like to develop a relationship with players and you know, see where we go from here, what would be the next thing that we could do. Um, so I had all those bands going, and when I did the 40th, birthday retrospective, I just thought, okay, I'm going to do them all in one week. This will be fantastic. And I was so exhausted at the end of the week. And I got up and I was like, you know, this is crazy. I can't, I gotta, I gotta do something here. So I, I'm never one for half measures. So instead of, you know, putting some of them on the back burner, I just canceled them all. I was like, that's it. Now I'm going to start from scratch. I did that. I didn't realize going in that that was the way it was going to happen. But um, the Sextet, the Quartet, Witness, Charms of the Night Sky, Tiny Bell Trio, the Trisha Brown Band, um, all of those projects, Sanctuary, um, great friends of mine, all of the musicians in those groups and, and the people who made it possible for me to, to make all that music, you know, that played it, that learned it, and that inspired me to write it. Um, but I just felt like I had to stop. And so the idea was to... <laughs> the reason I had all those bands was because I had a pretty wide-ranging vision of what I wanted to do in music. Like, I loved a lot of different music, and the only way I could try to express all of those sides was to have different bands. I didn't feel like I could have one band that would express everything. That felt like pastiche to me. It felt more like, let me have each project go in-depth in this, so I had a string group also. Um, the Tiny Bell Trio was sort of exploring a Balkan folk music and improvisation, and uh, the Sextet was exploring um, homage to great jazz composers and instrumentalists. Um, the Quartet was exploring trying to write harmonically without a chord instrument, with just three 
tones. Um, so after the 40th, I, I decided, let me try to do a band, and every time I get an idea, not start calling people and starting a new band, but go inside myself as a composer and see if I can find a way to synthesize all of these interests and bring them into a new. So that was when the quintet started with uh, Uri Kane and Chris Potter and uh, James Donnie. Genus and Clarence Penn, and then it became Donnie McCaslin. And, um, and I, I had a band called Keystone, which we still play sometimes, and that came about because I was writing music for silent films, and so I wanted to do electronic music and silent films. I, it was something that I was hearing together. And then I'm sure there's a couple others that I'm leaving out that happened in, in the interim. But I didn't, um, I, I, I guess the thing for me is if you write a little bit each day, you end up with a lot of music. So if you're a composer, I would advise just get in there and tough it out every day. Just get in there and write. We have a leg up on our friend Bob here because you know, as a musician, you, I feel like we can, we have the option to write it a lot, to, to, to approach it a lot of different ways, different tones, different colors. We can follow a theme as long as we want to or not. We're usually not given an assignment, you know, unless maybe you could say like a film composer or, mm -hmm. right. you know what I mean? Like, sure. uh, it's more just pure inspiration. Well, I, you, yeah, I think maybe we have a little more freedom in that, in that regard. And that, one last question I had for you before I open it up. Uh, one thing that's changed in the last 10 years is your embrace of new media. Um, and you seem to be one of the people, you've started your own record label. Um, you stream a lot of music that might not be available in um, you know, physical product, but if that's the proper term. Um, and as somebody, even with more than, even with one band, often to pull together people who have got other things going on and to do tours, mm -hmm. this I assume would be a great benefit. But how has all of this emergent, immersion in new media helped or challenged you? Um, yeah, you know, when I left um, Sony BMG, I decided to start my own label just, um, you know, so I could keep everything in print. That was the biggest reason, you know, being able to house everything. And then I realized as the years went by and the internet got bigger and bigger and broadband went everywhere, that we had this opportunity as independent musicians to, to, to make the music widely available that way. Um, and also that, you know, having a music company means you can house all of your activities, educational, you know, sheet music publishing, um, any interests that I have, I'm doing a podcast now where I talk to some of my favorite musicians. Um, you were blogging, weren't you? Or, uh, I blog a little bit, you know, and then there's social media. I think Twitter is really, really interesting. Um, and uh, I also, th I guess I would say, you know, for the love of the music, the most creative and interesting aspect of it is that you can release the music in any length or format or shape that you want to. You're not a prisoner of a 60 minute CD format anymore or a 42 minute LP. Um, and I think that's really kind of revolutionary and in a way you see some pop musicians taking advantage of that and not so many jazz musicians and I think that you know the internet is like, it's so suited to jazz because it just moves at the speed of light and it's completely improvised for them. Mm. And it's content hungry, you know? And, and so like, if you're on stage and you're a band leader and you have five minutes you want to kill, you want to be on stage with some jazz musicians because they have five minutes, no problem. <laughs> well, we've got about eight minutes, and I want to uh, open it up to any questions from the audience. We're not going to talk about what we're going to hear tonight um, out of respect for Dave's. I'll tell you a little bit about it. I'll tell you during the show. How many people are coming to the show? 
okay, well, then you'll, you'll, you'll hear it. And it's, it's this new quintet that I started last year and uh, we'll be playing music from the record Be Still, which is a collection of uh, traditional hymns and folk songs um, and this new record Time Travel. And uh, it's a really fun band and it's a whole new thing for me. Great, great new players. And I, I can just say, I heard the band, I think it was in November when, when you mm. were in Cambridge, end of last mm. year. It wasn't part of the 50th birthday right. tour, right? Uh, and um, it, Oh, it, that's right. We played the Regatta Bar. Regatta Bar, yeah. This quintet plus the great singer Aoife O'Donovan. Anybody know her? Sure. From Crooked Still and Go and, Rodeo Sessions. And you may even know her dad, who does a great Celtic music program on WGBH in Boston. Brian O'Donovan. I knew Brian. Celestial I didn't season? Realize. No, Celtic Sojourn. Celtic Sojourn. And I knew Brian. I didn't even know his daughter was a vocalist until I went to Dave's gig. Um, but it, it's great music. And the instrumental component, which is featured on the newest CD, is uh, equally wonderful. So uh, I don't have to encourage you all to come because you're all going to probably hold your nice seats uh, between now and 8.30. <laughs> However... You do have a chance to ask a couple of questions if there's anyone out there who does have a question. Yep. Did you uh, experiment with mouthpiece <laughs> trumpet uh, design kind of issues on a regular basis? Or did no. Did you find something and stick to it? I found something and stuck to it about 30 years ago. And, I, you know, part of that comes from the philosophy of Carmine Caruso. His thing was, it's not the horn, it's you. Whenever you'd have a problem, you know, talk about tough love. <laughs> so I found a horn that I liked and I just try to practice to play that well and I, I would also you know, add one thing which is I guess not a good message to young trumpet players but I stopped playing flugelhorn too and all the other doubles that you're supposed to play as a professional I guess I'm not really a professional trumpet player because I stopped playing flugelhorn because I, I for me I I felt like to be as expressive as I could be in the music on my instrument meant focusing solely on that one instrument. So I just spent as much time as I could with that horn and try to get as many different sounds out of it as I could. So I don't mess around with mouthpieces or lead pipes or changing horns. Um, people send me horns from time to time to try to get me to, you know, and I, I, I would love to find a better horn, but I haven't, so and send them all back. Any other questions? Yeah, I saw you last class. Hummer with Joe Lovano uh, mm. at Newport. That's, um, for instance, I was just uh, curious as to the origin of the concept. And, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. We had a fun gig there at Newport. Um, it's, uh, he's talking about this quintet that I co-lead with Joe Lovano called Sound Prince, and it's a celebration, a reflection on the life and music and vision of Wayne Shorter. Um, but we decided to do it in a way where we play original music that we've both written for the occasion. It's half his tunes, half my tunes, and the rhythm section is Joey Barron on drums, Linda O oh on bass, and Lawrence Fields on piano. And we've been doing it for almost a year and a half now, touring a lot. There's not a record yet, but it's, it's going to happen eventually. And uh, one of the wonderful, th I mean, I, I've known Joe forever, for, for a long, long time. And so we, every time I would see him, we'd be like, oh, we got to do something, we got to do something. So it finally, we coalesced around this idea of Wayne. And Wayne, is, Wayne Shorter is turning 80 this year. Um, so there's a long series of concerts where we'll play and then the trio of Jerry Allen, Esperanza Spaulding, and Terry Lynn Carrington will play and then Wayne's Quartet will play. So it's a triple bill. We're, we will be in Montreal, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the sort of touring package. So incredibly inspiring for me and uh, every time I'm around Wayne Shorter I feel like I learned something. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got time for one more, if anybody has one more question. Um, thank you, Dave. As thank always, you. Enlightening. Thank you all. Really looking forward to the music tonight. And um, I, as I say, I don't have to encourage uh, 
uh, anyone here to come back. I will encourage you to come back to our other sessions. Tomorrow, uh, rather than do an interview down here, we're going to do the annual listening session upstairs in the gallery. And um, in, instead of picking a classic album to listen to and talk about, uh, this year I thought I would do something different. The, the ensemble down here tomorrow night is called the Saturn People's Sound Collective. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to focus on one of the uh, inspirations for that group, Sun Ra, and his music. So we're going to be doing an introduction to the music of Sun Ra up in the gallery at 5.30. And I would encourage everybody to attend. There's a lot of different music and a lot of different kinds of music. And uh, once upon a time, I sat and talked with Sun Ra, just like Dave and I talked. And, and I found that. Uh, that uh, relic from 1975, and I thought I would read a bit of it to, uh, oh, to wow. give you the That's feeling cool. of um, conversing Mr. With, uh, with Sonny. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can call me Mr. Ra, or you can call me Mr. E, as he used to say. Oh. Um, but uh, see everybody here at 8.30, see everybody tomorrow upstairs at 5.30, and then we'll be back here with the Fringe 5.30 on Wednesday. So thank Great. You. Thank you, Tom.